Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 18. We're going to continue our series on the armor of God. We need to put on the armor of God. It's not just a a picture that God gives us, but it's a command. And I believe that every day that you need to put on the armor of God as you face the battles of this life. Now, last week we gave you a a demonstration of that armor in modern armor for our modern soldier. So this week we decided instead what we're going to do is show you what the armor would look like back in the day. So we found a real he-man to come up here and to demonstrate that, that, that armor for you. And uh, he's got it right here. He's got it on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and the breastplate of righteousness and on through there. And, uh, and, and just to remind us, there's both the historical context, what they would have understood the armor to look like in their day, and then there's the context of how we understand it today as well. Thank you, sir. All right, turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 18. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. My two pages turned there. Give me a second. Uh, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take on you the whole armor of God, that you may be withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we pray that you would help us to truly understand what it means to be to be able to put on the armor of God every day. We know that there's not physical armor that can detect, to, to protect us from the attacks of Satan, but we know that we can put on the armor of God, truth and righteousness, faith. And so we pray that you would help us understand that, those principles. And today, especially, Lord, we, help, we ask that you help us understand the wiles of the devil, the methods that he uses, the devices that he uses to defeat us. And we ask this in Christ's name, and for his sake. Amen. I want to talk today, before we get into talking about putting on the individual pieces of armor, I want to look at verse number 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And so what does the Bible mean when it talks about the wiles of the devil? What is it that we have to fight against? The, the Bible tells us that the word wiles here is a word that in the Greek comes from our word methodia, the methods of the devil. The devil's got certain methods that he uses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, the Bible says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I have found a lot of Christians are ignorant. Some people are ignorant of salvation. They don't really know what salvation is. Other people are ignorant of the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1, it says that we're not to be ignorant of the spiritual gifts. And I, I have found that most Christians not only don't know what their gift is, they don't even know what the gifts of the Spirit are. And this is another place in the Bible that says that God says, you know what, don't be stupid. Don't be ignorant. You need to understand and know what are the devices of the devil. So that word devices, what does that mean? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 3 through 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty through God to pulling down a stronghold. So we need to put on the armor of God. Then it goes on to say, Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That word thought, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, the word thought is the same word as the word, the devices of the devil back in in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. 
So when it talks about his devices, he's talking about the thoughts. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. See, the devil, he gets into our mind, and, and, and he gives us the wrong thoughts and the wrong thinking. The, the devil is very subtle. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, it says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity is in Christ. See, Satan attacks, it's not outward front attacks. He is very subtle. He comes in in ways that we don't see and we don't realize that he's attacking us. Now, if we're gonna, it says that as he beguiled Eve, so let's see what he did to Eve. Go Put a marker in Ephesians 6 and go back to uh, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, the, the Satan, through the serpent, he, 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 uh, uh, he, he tempted Eve. And it says in verse number 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, You may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So if we want to understand how the devil attacks, we can learn from Eve, because that's the example that God uses for us. He says, as the serpent beguiled Eve. Now, part of this series, we're doing uh, weekly devotions to go along with the message. I hope you've done them. We had five this week that we uh, made available on our church app. And uh, if you have had trouble getting to it, let us know that. And we've got five more this next week. And in three of those devotions, we're going to talk about how he tempted Eve. Because the way he tempted Eve, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is the same way that he tempts you and I as well. But suffice it to say that what the devil primarily does is he sows doubt. In this whole passage, he tried to get Eve to doubt God. In verse number one, he said, did God really say that? He wanted her to doubt God. In, in verse number two and three, uh, the woman began to doubt and she began to add to what God said. He said, you know, he said that God said we can't eat of it, we can't even touch it. Now, did God say that they could not touch it? No, he didn't. Now, if you're not supposed to eat something, it's probably a good idea that you don't touch it. I I'm going to tell you, if I touch the chocolate chip cookie, I'm going to eat it. Okay? It, it doesn't, I, I can't touch it without eating it. It's going to happen. And if I see the chocolate chip cookie, I'm probably going to eat it as well. We take cookies to uh, new visitors in the church when we're able to, and sometimes they're not home, so we bring them back home and put the bag on the counter. And when I get up at night and walk by the table and see that cookie there, it is tempting, isn't it? Uh, you know, just seeing the cookie makes me want to eat it. And, and you know what? It's a good principle. If God says, you know what? Don't do this. It's a good idea. Maybe I ought not to touch it or look at it either. I, I think that's a good principle. God didn't say that, but that's a good principle to have. But she, she began to doubt God. And then further on down, the serpent said to the woman, you, you shall not surely die. See, God, you know, don't believe what God said. And then he goes on to say later, and it says, if you eat this fruit, you're going you're gonna to be as gods. You see, Satan wants us to doubt God. That's where he attacks us. He wants us to doubt God. And number two, he, he, he twists scripture. In Matthew chapter four, when he tempted Jesus, in verse number six, it says, and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. See, Satan will use scripture, but what he does is he twists it and turns it. He takes it out of context and what it really is saying. 
And we need to be careful. And so often we justify what we're doing because Satan has twisted the word of God. And we're not using it the way that God intended for it to be used. And so he'll quote scripture, but he twists scripture. Now, Jesus, when he was tempted, each time he was tempted, he quoted scripture and he quoted it correctly in context. And so the word of God will defend us against Satan, but Satan will try to twist the word of God as well. And then Satan also lies. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, it says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Satan will tell you all kinds of lies. He'll try to get you to believe what's not true. He'll try to get you, he'll lie to you about God. He'll lie to you about your family, your spouse. He'll lie to you about other people. Oh, look what they, you know, he'll lie and lie and lie. And we need to realize that Satan is the father of lies. Satan transforms himself. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, it says, in no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. I believe that one of the reasons why people fall to the wiles of the devil is because they don't recognize him. See, most people think that Satan looks like this. You know, isn't this the picture most people have of Satan? Uh, that's not from the Bible. That was some artist drawing years ago. But Satan doesn't always look like this. You know what Satan can look like? He can look like this. You see, in, in, in Matthew 16, 23, it says, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, did Peter love God? Without a doubt. Was Peter a Christian? No question on that. Peter didn't want Jesus to die, but he wasn't listening to Jesus. And even godly Christians, Brother Sears is a godly man. He loves the Lord. There's no doubt about that. But you know you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. And you know sometimes even Christians can be used by Satan to deceive us. Satan also looks like this. In 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen, 15, it says, there, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Do you know that sometimes Satan can, can, be, can use the, the preaching? He can use the minister of righteousness. He can transform himself. You know, not all preachers today are preaching the word of God. Not everything that calls itself Christian is Christian. And we need to understand that. And sometimes Satan will use something that's so-called Christian to deceive us if we're not careful, we're not using discernment. Satan can also look like this next one. Google. You say, Pastor, how do you know Google's of Satan? Well, I found it in the Bible. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. It says, But these were false prophets also among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you, who privately should bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall be, they be with feigned word make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And if you notice those little letters in yellow, that spells out Google. So they must be of the devil. Now, this is what happens on Google. Is you get all kinds of crazy people saying all kinds of crazy things. And, 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 and they take and they twist and turn the word of God and, and Satan uses. Now, I'm thankful for Google. I, I look up things on Google. As I prepare my message, many times I'll go to Google. But you have to go to Google with a lot of discernment. I'm amazed that a number of Christians come to me and say, well, pastor, I heard this on YouTube, or I, I saw this on Google, and so it must be right. No, Satan can use Google for his lies. And we have to be careful of that. Finally, Satan can look like this. I'm looking for a place to go home to this afternoon, by the way. <laughs> 
Now, my wife's not the devil. But you know what? God can use your spouse, can use your parents, your children. Satan can use them also. And I've seen Satan use a wife or a husband to discourage their spouse. Remember in the book of Job, in Job chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaks. What shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. And you know what? I've seen Satan use a wife or a husband to discourage their spouse from serving the Lord or to make them angry or to make them bitter. I've seen Satan use children and parents to destroy somebody's walk with the Lord. See, folks, Satan is subtle, and he's deceptive, and he can transform himself into an angel of light. And that's why we need to understand what are the wiles of, the, of Satan, to defend against him. What, what are his devices that he uses? What are his methods? Don't let Satan hide the gospel from you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Do you know that Satan can blind you to the gospel? He can hide it from you. And one of the places that Satan hides the gospel is in religion. In Matthew 24, 24, it says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Satan can get you to think that you're saved through your religion, that that's what's going to get you to heaven. He's blinded you to the true gospel. You see, in religion, Satan gives you just enough truth to fool you. And don't be blinded by religion from seeing the gospel. Don't be blinded by your good works. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name done many wonderful works, and thy name have cast out devils, and, and then will I... Uh, then will I profess I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. See, here were people that the devil deceived. If you're just good enough, you're going to go to heaven. And, and, and they were trying to get to heaven on their good works. But Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, then not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet there are people today that are blinded and think, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. I'm going to go to heaven because of my religion. And that's not true. It's a lie of the devil. And sometimes... The devil hides the gospel in plain sight. You ever had that happen? You ever had something you couldn't find and afterwards it was right there, right, right where everybody could see it? It was right there in plain sight and you couldn't see it. In Acts chapter 26, verses 26 through 28, it says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner, King Agrippa. Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Here was the gospel right in front of the king. He knew about Jesus who had died, was buried, and rose again. He, he knew about what the prophets said. He had heard the gospel. But he was blinded to his own need. And I meet people all the time that have gone to church week after week, month after month, sometimes from childhood, they've heard the gospel, they know the gospel, and yet they're not saved. And Satan has somehow hidden it from them. And they think, because I come from a Christian home, or they, they think, because I know the gospel but never received Christ as their Savior, that somehow that's good enough, and they're not saved. Don't let Satan hide the gospel. Hide Jesus from you. Don't listen to his lies. 
Satan is the father of lies. Turn over to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. One of the lies of Satan is that you're not really saved or you've lost your salvation. In 1 John chapter 5 and beginning with verse number 9, 1 John chapter 5 and, and beginning with verse number 9, the Bible says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness of himself. He that believeth not God shall, hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God had given of his Son. And this is the record that God had given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. See, the devil says, well, you can't really know for sure you're going to heaven. How can anybody know that? That's arrogant. The devil says, how, how do you know you're going to heaven? Just because you prayed a prayer when you were a six-year-old boy? The devil will say to you, how can you think you're going to heaven with what you just did? You must have lost your salvation. You see, the devil is a, is a liar. And he lies about the truth of the gospel. Now, if you've never prayed and asked Jesus to be your Savior, then you are lost and going to hell. But you can't lose your salvation. And we need to realize that the devil's a liar. And when he says you're not saved, is he lying to you? Now, the truth may be you're not saved and you need to get saved. But if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can't lose your salvation. And you're going to heaven. Go over to 1 John chapter 1. Another lie of the devil is that either you won't sin or he'll say to you, he'll lie to you and say, oh, you, you're no good. You can never be good. In 1 John chapter 1, verse number 5, it says, This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The lie of the devil is this. He says, well, if you're saved by grace, then you can just go ahead and sin. It doesn't matter. But it does matter. You can't lose your salvation, but if you're truly saved, God says you should not want to sin, and there are consequences to sin. Or the lie of the devil is, well, look at you. You sinned. You must have lost your salvation. But God says, no, just confess your sins. I'm faithful and just to forgive your sins. God's goal is that we don't sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So the devil's lie is, you can get away with it. You won't get caught. You're different. It won't happen to you. That's a lie of the devil. And he's the father of lies. In Revelation 12, 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. The devil is an accuser. And not only is he accusing you before God, but the lie of the devil is the accusations in here. You're not good enough. You'll never change. God can't change you. He's the accuser in your head that's telling you you'll never be different. Look at what you did. And God says, don't listen to that accuser. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, it says, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did... In the person of Christ, as he did, 
beforehand, I lost my page here. Give me a second to get right back on the right page here again. So year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so he provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. The devil's an adversary. He's going to provoke you. There's nothing harder on a woman who wants to have a baby who can't. And boy, the devil will just find that weakness. He'll find that place in your life, and he'll just keep pushing at it, pushing at it, pushing at it. And he will say, you know, you can't, how can God be so good and not let you have this? And he's a liar. We need to understand the wiles of the devil, the methods of the devil, his devices that he uses to defeat us. But we also need to realize that we can't give up topography. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 27. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 27. The Bible says neither give place to the devil. The word place there in the Greek language is the word topos. It's where we get our, to, our word topography from. Those of you in the military that know if, if you leave the enemy with any topography, if you leave them a place, that's a base that they can attack you from. And you've got to get them out of there. And you've got to get the devil out of your life. And you say, well, what are some of the places of the devil? Well, first of all, in verse 25, it says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Honesty. I'm, I'm here to tell you, if there's a lie that you're saying over and over again, if there's something that's not, you're not being honest about, it's, it's, it's giving the devil a place in your life. If there's something in your marriage that you're not being honest about, if there's something in your life that you're not being honest about, that you're not being true about, that's a place of the devil. It's giving him a place in your life. Then you go on in verse number 26, and it says, that, um, Be ye angry and sin not. And emotions, anger and, and hurt and depression, that's a place for the devil. There's nothing wrong with our emotions. God gave us our emotions, and they're there for a purpose. But when we let that emotion control us, we're given a place to the devil in our lives. Go down to verse number 26. Uh, verse number tw- I'm sorry, verse number 28. It says, let them to steal, stole, steal no more, but rather let them labor working with his hands. Stealing is a place for the devil. Not having a good work ethic. Idle hands or the devil's workshop is a true stain. And, and we need to realize that that's a given the, the devil a place in your life. Down in verse number 29, it talks about corrupt communication. That's just not swearing. That's not just swearing and saying bad words. I believe that's a place of the devil. When you have that habit in your life, you're giving the devil a place in your life. But it's just being gossiping and, and talking about other people and talking bad about people. That's giving the devil a place in your life. And then you go down further there in verse number 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. In verse number 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. When you're bitter and you're angry and you hold on to these things, that's giving the devil a place in your life. It's giving up topography. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at verses number 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 3 through 6. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We need the armor of God. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the power of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. He says, It says, tearing down strongholds. Some of you, the problem is you've given the devil a stronghold in your life. You've not only given him a place in your life, but it's a stronghold, a place where he's got a fort already built. He's got the defenses already there, a place where he can attack you from. You say, well, what are strongholds? In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Strongholds are besetting sins. Those sins that we struggle with over and over and over again. 
It's the addictive sins, things like alcohol or drugs, things like pornography and other areas in our life, the things that we struggle with and we just can't seem to get victory over. And those are the strongholds of Satan that he's taken control of in our life. And every time he wants, he just reaches out and grabs that again and again and again. And you've got to get victory over those besetting sins. You've got to take away the secret sins the ones that are hidden away in your life. See, God talks about in Psalms chapter 32 when we confess that sin, it talks about how that, that frees us. And for some of you, there's things that you've hidden away in your life and you've not dealt with. You've hidden it from yourself. You've hidden it from your spouse. You've hidden it from your parents. And those secret sins are holding you back because they're strongholds of the devil. What we need to do is we need to build our own strongholds. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust him. And we need to build our own strongholds, the, the strongholds of the Lord. In James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You see, the way to resist the devil is to draw nigh to God. You need to have the strongholds where you can run to that stronghold, and it's a place of safety, it's a place of protection, it's a place of strength, because God is there. That's why you need your daily devotions. That's why you need your prayer time. You need to build strongholds in your life. And don't lose the high ground. In Romans chapter 6, it says that we are to yield not yourselves to sin. And what happens in our lives is, you know, in battle, whoever's got the high ground has got the, most, the best position. And when you lose the high ground spiritually, when you start looking at things and going places and doing things you ought not to do, you've lost the high ground and you're giving place to the devil. What are the weapons that the devil uses against us? In 2 Corinthians 2, we looked at this verse earlier, verse 11. Let's look at verse 10 11. It says, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave you anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we're not ignorant of his devices. One of Satan's weapons, and I believe in many cases this is his number one weapon he uses to defeat Christian after Christian after Christian is an unwillingness to forgive. Your marriage is being torn apart because you won't forgive your husband, you won't forgive your wife. There are children here who have never forgiven their parents. There's parents that don't, won't forgive their children. You've got somebody that's hurt you and you won't let it go. And as long as you're not willing to forgive, you're giving place to the devil. It's become a stronghold in your life. And the only way to victory is forgiveness. In James chapter 4, and verses 6 through 7, James chapter 4 Beginning with verse number six, the Bible says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resist the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Pride. Boy, pride is such a weapon of Satan. You're too proud to ask for help. You're too proud to ask for counseling. You're too proud to ask somebody to pray for you. The Bible says, Confess your faults one to another. Why? Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And when you're so proud, you're not willing to admit, I've got a problem. And when you're too proud to ask for help and to ask for prayer, that's a stronghold of Satan in your life. And he will defeat you every time. Especially in those besetting sins. Another one is depression. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah was depressed because she couldn't have a child. It was a terrible thing, but she allowed it to control her life. And she couldn't love her husband who dearly loved her, and she couldn't enjoy life, and she was just weeping and crying all the time. And, and, and her adversary, the devil, had full control in that situation. 
It was a stronghold of Satan. And it wasn't until she finally said, you know what? I'm going to give this to God, and I'm going to get up and stop being depressed that God changed her life and the devil was kicked out. And you got you to deal with that depression. you got to deal with those emotions. Emotions are bad, but often the devil will use the emotions when they're out of control. And then there's doctrine. You know what? The devil, he loves it when you don't study the word. And when you don't know what you believe and why, because that's when he can fool to you. He can fool you. He twists scriptures, and he'll use them against you if you don't know what you believe and why. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that, that sin in the latter times shall depart from the faith. I'm sorry, that, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with hot iron. And it goes on from there. That's why Google scares me so much as a pastor. There's a lot of good preaching on Google. There's a lot of good teaching on Google. But there's a lot of things that are false doctrine. And there's a lot of Christians that don't have the discernment to know right from wrong and to understand truth from falsehood. And you need to be careful in this area because he'll use this against you. When you don't know what you believe and you don't know why you believe it, that's a stronghold of Satan. And then emotion. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. When you let your emotion control you rather than you control the emotion, you're giving a place to the devil. You're inviting him in. And then idleness. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul warned the widow ladies, be careful. Make sure you're serving the Lord. Make sure you're doing something. Because when you got idleness, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. When you're not busy serving the Lord, the day, Satan will find something for you to do. You know, that's when we pick up the TV and start watching things we shouldn't watch. That's when we get on the internet and start scrolling to places we shouldn't scroll. That's when we get in the car and we start going places we shouldn't be. Because we're not busy doing what we should be doing. When David, at the time that the kings were supposed to go to war, David stayed home and that's when he fell into sin. It's the devils. That's giving him a place in your life. We need to put on the armor of God. This is a spiritual battle. It's not going to be one in the flesh. But we also need to understand what are the wiles of the devil. What are the methods that he uses to defeat us? What are the devices? What's the wrong thinking? Because he's the, so subtle. And he's the father of lies. So look at your life right now. Are you believing a lie of Satan? You need to rebuke him and say, that's, no lie. that's not true. God loves me. And he can't stop loving me. And God is a God of forgiveness. But he's also a holy God that doesn't want me to sin. And we've got to believe God rather than Satan. Let's bow in prayer.